Hello and welcome to the session in which we will discuss cost flow assumptions. Now what is cost flow assumption? That's an important topic when it comes to inventory and cost of goods sold. So what is the main idea? What's the big idea? Here's the idea. When the company purchases inventory, and this topic is very important for merchandisers, in other words, companies like Walmart, Target, supermarkets. Now, from an accounting perspective, that's a very important topic as well. So here's what happens. When a company buys inventory, they have the inventory as an asset on the balance sheet. So whatever inventory they have, it sits on the balance sheet as an asset. Eventually, this inventory is sold. Once the inventory is sold, it becomes cost of goods sold on the income statement. So what is cost flow assumption is how the inventory flows from the balance sheet to the income statement. Why is that important? Because the company could have many types of inventory and they could have the same type of inventory but purchase at different dates. So let's take a look at this inventory notice. These boxes, this pallet, this pallet, this pallet, and this pallet, they're the same. But the company could have paid $5 per pallet here. Let me change colors. $5, $4 here, $4.50 here, $8 here, and $10 for this pallet. So when they actually sell one of these pallets, they all look the same. Which of these pallets they sold? They're the same ones. So this is what we have to do. We have to determine how the inventory is flowing from the balance sheet to the income statement. So what do companies do? They use assumptions. What is assumptions? It means it doesn't matter how we do it. For From an accounting perspective, we are going to assume a certain method. Now, what are those assumptions? Company could use FIFO, something called FIFO, which is first in, first out, or they could use LIFO, last in first out now for now i'm going to give you a uh, a picture to show you what fifo and lifo is but we're going to work examples and illustrate this much more in in depth so what is fifo what is lifo well this is what the picture would look like fifo whatever you ate first comes out first first in first out lifo whatever you ate last last in first out I hope this is an illustrative picture. Okay, not very academic, but I hope it makes the point. So this is what FIFO and LIFO, but we will keep that picture in mind <laughs> as we go through this lesson. Also, the company could use the weighted average or something called the specific method. We'll look, we'll look at each one of these methods or assumptions in a comprehensive example in this session, but you need to understand the overall big picture. And there are two methods to track inventory. We already know this from the prior session. We have the periodic method and we have the perpetual method. And we covered both of these methods. So if you don't know what a periodic versus perpetual, please go back and view them. The reason I'm saying this, because in this session, I will show you both the periodic FIFO, the perpetual FIFO, the periodic LIFO, the perpetual LIFO. You have to look, you have to be familiar with both if you are an intermediate accounting student or a CPA exam candidate. Now, the best way to, to do what? To show you this is to work through an illustration. And what is an illustration? An illustration is a complete example showing you how FIFO and LIFO works. So this way you understand via numbers. Let's go ahead and get started. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, FarhatLectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. So to illustrate the concept, we will be using a comprehensive example. Now, what should you do? You should take all the data on the slide because this is the data that we will be using. So we have Adam Company, 
and we're looking at their inventory for the year X5. We're, we're going to be giving the beginning inventory and purchases during X5. So the beginning inventory from January 1st, they had 5,000 unit and the unit cost is $5. Therefore, the total cost of the inventory is 25,000. Then the company made three additional purchases throughout the year. On January 10th, they bought 1,000 unit at $6. On April 22nd, they bought 3,000 units at 7, and on November, on November the 15th, they bought 3,000 units at 750. Now, it's very important to understand that, that when we take beginning inventory, which is what we started with, beginning inventory, plus the purchases, plus those purchases, will give us something called goods available for sale. What's goods available for sale? It means how many units and what's the total cost you invested in your inventory? The total unit you had for the whole year is 12,000. 5,000 you started with and you purchased 7,000 throughout the year. So you had goods available for sale 12,000. What is the total cost of these units? The total cost is 74,500. You started with 25,000, you, you, you invested 6,000, then 21,000, then 22,500. The total investment in your inventory is 74,500. This figure is important. You will see this figure repeatedly again and again and again as we go through each example. 74,500. What, what is this figure? This is the figure that's called cost of goods sold. Why is this important? I'm going to tell you why. Because some of that cost will stay in ending inventory. So some of it will stay in ending inventory and some of it will be sold and it will be considered cost of goods sold. However, it does not matter how much we give to ending inventory, how much we give to cost of goods sold. The total will be 74,500. The same thing for the units, the 12,000 unit. Some of it will be an ending inventory in terms of unit, and some of it will be cost of goods sold. And I hope this makes sense. Of the 12,000, you're gonna, some of it will not be sold. 1,000 will not be sold. It means the 11,000 were sold. Or 2,000 will not be sold. The remaining 10,000 are sold. Cost of goods sold. But the total is 12,000. You are working with 12,000. And this is a good way to do what? To do reconciliation. Make sure you accounted for everything because you know it's 12,000 unit and 74,500. Now, throughout the year, you made additional sales. On January 15th, you sold 3,500 units. Those are the sale and those are the purchases. On April 27th, you sold 1,500 units. On November 20th, you sold 3,000. Notice I'm not, giving you, I'm not giving you the selling prices because we don't care about the selling prices. I want you to focus on inventory and cost of goods sold. So notice what we did is we sold 8,000 units in total. What does that mean? It means... I know now that I'm going to have 4,000 unit in ending inventory and 8,000 unit in cost of goods sold because they are sold. What do we do when we sell those unit? We expense them in a form of cost of goods sold. The only problem here becomes what is the cost of the 8,000 unit? In other words, okay, we sold 8,000 unit, but which 8,000 unit did we sell? Notice we have 12. Which 8,000 unit we sold because it makes a difference if we sold some of the beginning or none of the beginning or we have to sell some of the beginning because we only purchased 7,000 so how did we sell which unit we sold and what's the cost of the 4,000 remaining units and this is where and this is where those assumptions that I'm talking about will help so we have to choose a method and make this assumption and move along with it so let's take a look at this 4,000 and 8,000 unit one more time. We have 12,000 unit goods available for sale. We're going to have 4,000 and ending inventory. It does not matter which method we use. We're going to have 4,000 unit and we're going to have 8,000 unit and cost of goods sold. Does not matter which method we used. Now, what's going to make a difference is the dollar amount assigned to ending inventory and the dollar amount assigned to cost of goods sold the dollar amount assigned to those but both of them they will end up to be 74,500 just like beginning inventory and purchases equal to 74,500 equal to the goods available for sale 74,500 so make sure you understand this and you, you will see this repeatedly so notice the 74,500 
will be allocated between cost of goods sold cost of goods sold and cost of the ending inventory on hand the total will be 74,500 so having this picture in mind we can start to dive into the various method the first method I will be using is the average cost specifically the average periodic cost what is the average periodic cost what's the average cost the average cost is is this compute an average cost for all the inventory that you purchased and use that average cost that's it and if we're using the periodic average cost it means we compute that average cost listen to me carefully at the end of the period so when you're using the periodic method because the perpetual will be different will you will compute that average cost at the at the end of the period so let's take a look at what we have we purchased 5,000 unit at five dollars 25,000 then we purchased 7,000 unit in total at various prices end up to be 49,500 the total cost invested is 74,500 and we purchased 12,000 units what can we do now we know we purchased 12,000 unit we know that total investment was 74,500 what do we do we compute an average cost so if I take 74,500 divide this by 12,000 units to find what's my average cost and what did when did I do this I waited till the end of the accounting period to do this computation why because I'm using the periodic method are you saying if I'm using another method I will be doing it differently and the answer is yes if I'm using the perpetual you're gonna see how so my average cost is six dollars and twenty cent so what happens is this if I have twelve four thousand unit left which we already determined we have four thousand unit left I multiply this I assume I have them at six dollars and twenty cent and how many unit did I sell eight thousand unit and if I have eight thousand unit left what's the what's the cost six dollars rounding 20 or 21 cent it does not matter it's just rounding 74 nine seventy four thousand forty nine thousand seven hundred therefore my weighted average unit cost is 620 and if I add I already know this I already did this computation and if I add those two they equal to 74,500 so notice what I did I computed an, av an average cost again this is rounding it should be 620 uh, it's 621 to make it exactly equal to um, 74,500 but you, you understand it's the average cost depending on how you round it now uh, this is the periodic periodic method so this is the average cost periodic method how about if I'm using the average cost using a perpetual the perpetual method under the perpetual method what's gonna happen is this will compute a moving average unit for each additional inventory purchase so what does that mean it means your average cost will change with every additional purchase so we're gonna add the cost of the previous balance to the cost of the new purchase then we divide the total cost by the number of units at hand very simple I'm gonna show you what it is so what should you do now you want to go to Farhat lectures look at multiple choice exercises additional lectures that will help you whether you are an intermediate accounting student an accounting student a CPA exam candidate CMA exam candidate or studying for some other professional certification the best investment you can make is invest in yourself good luck study hard and of course stay safe